Hi, this is Friends in Our Places. I'm Lorena Williams. And I'm Victor Mujedin, and we are here to connect the community of artists through conversation. And we are here today with Melissa Barba, former assistant director at the Rubin Center. Hi, Melissa. Hello, Good morning. Hello. Hello. We're so excited to have you here today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Hey. Yes. You are definitely someone uh, who we thought of right away when we were talking about having these conversations. We made a quick list and I think you came up very quickly because we know that you have so much insight into what a lot of artists um, want to learn about. So that's why uh, we're here and we're excited to, to talk to you. Can you introduce sure. yourself, please, to our audience? Yeah, for sure. So my name is Melissa Barba, and I was um, recently, um, the most recently, the direct, the assistant director of the Stanley and Gerald Rubin Center for the Visual Arts, um, which is a university art gallery at the University of Texas at El Paso. And it's a contemporary art space. So um, it's a very small staff. So my my jobs consisted of a little bit of everything. So <laughs> from like grant writing to um, education to outreach. Um, so we did a lot of outreach with um, the local school districts here. Um, and then prior to being at the Rubin Center, um, I was at the Isleta Independent School District as the visual arts uh, facilitator and gallery curator. So I had the wonderful opportunity of working with amazing art teachers. Um, For you. And, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I tell people already, like that was totally like my dream job. It really was. I felt so lucky to be around um, people who are just always inspired and, and sometimes exhausted, which was totally normal too. But, um, but ultimately just like showed up every day and brought their creativity and their spirit and their energy um to so many kids and really was the reason why so many kids were going to school every day and showing up and learning and and excited about life so that was such a privilege um and before that I worked at um several different museums just doing like more education curator stuff I've been an art teacher before um just a little bit of everything <laughs> so so let's go back. You said you were an art teacher first. Um, how long ago yeah, was that? I'm super curious about that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so there's a kind of an interesting, like a long line trajectory. I was an art teacher at Parkland Middle School. Oh, I didn't know that. For And actually, I worked with Ed Salcedo um, okay. before he moved over to Del Valle. Um, But I was there for a really short time because... When I had moved there, I was recently married and my ex-husband and I um, had gotten into graduate school. So we both moved to the University of Colorado at Boulder um, to go to graduate school. So um, I, I, I did go to graduate school there, but I mean, we definitely left because he got accepted to the programs. So I didn't have much of an opportunity to continue. Uh, with teaching because when I got there, there were no jobs in art education. And I also wasn't certified in the state um, cause they had like an overwhelming number at least in the area I was in. Um, so I worked for a program called ArtsBridge which was um, sort of a bilingual program working with my young migrant uh, farm workers kids. And it was, yeah, it was a bilingual program sort of teaching about the arts and their culture. Uh, wow. So, yeah. and then when I, and then I went to, to school in Colorado and I got my master's um, in art history degree and had twins. I say that it's like <laughs> such a small dot sentence, but like had twins. Because there's nothing else, I decided to have twins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had, I had twins in the time of just recently finished. And then we returned to El Paso um, and, and then everything kind of, there were just so many opportunities in El Paso to um, to be in the arts. So that's what I did for a really what, long time. Yeah. What did I you get it. your undergrad or your undergrad in? That's a great question. Um, so I got my undergraduate degree in um, psychology and political science. Oh, wow. Um, I had a teacher who was just extraordinary and she made me excited about everything. Uh, so, um, so there was that. And then I went back to school to get my uh, degree in art 
and then art education or a certification in art education. So, but I never really, really had an opportunity. I mean, I've practiced it in a thousand ways, but in, in, in a sort of formal school setting, I haven't had that much of an opportunity. What made, what made you choose to go into the art? I mean, that, that art history route. I love it. I've always loved it. I think even in like the trajectory of my career, when you see my resume, it's kind of like, like, whoa. Yeah. I was <laughs> like, hey, what happened here? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, for sure. And I think um, the bottom line is I've always just done what I loved. I've just done oh, nice. it with like almost an arrogance and almost like a confidence and a craziness. Like it's That's just- fantastic. Like, yeah, but it's, it's tough too. Like, I think when I started the program um, in Colorado, I didn't have the same- experience that most of my other students around me did like there were a lot of a lot of my friends too were you know came from very privileged backgrounds had traveled through Europe with their parents uh, you know had a very different experience than I did I mean I had taken some classes in undergrad that I absolutely loved I love museums I love art I love I just the visual culture is super exciting to me and sort of learning about history and cultures and stories and everything through arts is so exciting to me and um so yeah can, can you touch a little bit on what it was like to go to graduate school while expecting um I, I you know as a woman and I got my master's degree later in my life <clears throat> but I saw a lot of young women or women who were having children and there was actually a pregnant woman in my graduate class and I remember thinking man it's hard enough it's hard enough to be a mother and expecting, but then to do a graduate program at the same time. What was that like? Yeah, it was super difficult. So it was at the end of my graduate career. Um, and, you know, it's funny. It was, it was even physically hard to do it. If, like, I remember correctly, I was even afraid to put the computer by my stomach because you just never know, like, maybe yeah. there's <laughs> You know, I was just so hyper conscious about everything. So I remember having like pillows on my stomach in kind of a way. So I would even type. I'm sure it's like totally not ergonomic. <laughs> <for life. laughs> um, but it was just it was it was physically hard to do because at the time I was writing my thesis and I was also writing a really difficult thesis, too. I was writing on um, the visual polemics coming out of the Wadis, um murders of women but from the perspective of the mothers so being pregnant and like sort of really uh, dealing with the reality of what was happening um, was was difficult even my thesis director was like Melissa maybe you should like pick some renaissance piece like you know, just, <laughs> but I also really felt connected to it and it was something meaningful and at the time there wasn't a lot of research done about it and so that was it, it was it was physically tough. It was emotionally tough. And I just felt really, really committed to trying to finish before, um, before I had the twins, because I knew if I didn't defend my thesis before then, I wasn't sure if I would ever do that. Like, it's one thing to have one baby and be exhausted and everything, but two, I just, I had no point of reference. And I felt like, you know, my ex-husband was also getting his PhD. So I felt like, I don't know where we're going to be. I don't know what life is going to look like. And there's a really good possibility if I don't get to this. So it was physically difficult. And I just really felt like, I mean, talk about a drive to do that. I would wake up early, even when I was sick. I would wake up like when I was, I, I just remember just all the pains, like, you know, your body's like shifting. And it's also like a party inside of you, right? I remember no. the day I defended my thesis. <laughs> I was sitting around and literally like they're asking me these super critical, thoughtful, theoretical questions about um, art and what's happening and like making sure it's not like a sociological perspective, but pushing it more towards like the history of like protest art and feminism and literally like there's somebody like sitting on my vertebrae and like, <laughs> like there's like some kind of a foot that's like charged in and I'm literally like Okay. And I even remember like shifting my body like side to side because I felt like if I like lull them, then maybe they will let me <laughs> let me have this like three hours of like critical thought. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it was tough for sure. And I, I feel grateful for I, I I've always felt grateful for the opportunity. I felt grateful to be in school. I felt grateful to be surrounded by such um sort of interesting people and and I felt grateful too. I mean, it was really a tough time when, you know, we weren't working virtually and I was also on bed rest. So my, my ex-husband used to like take, you know, my, 
300 pages or whatever. And he would take it and deliver it to the boxes because I couldn't. And so he was really like seminal and kind of helping me finish uh, that part and get feedback. It's not like it wasn't even, it wasn't that, that long ago, but um, it was 15 years ago. I can tell you exactly. Wow. <laughs> wow your babies are 15. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, wow. But yeah. And I had these pictures. It was so funny. I remember being like, my ex is going to come in and take pictures. And I'm like, oh, please. Like, you know, I'm just like, just, you know, and I'm on the computer and stuff. And I'm so grateful. <laughs> I'm so grateful for those pictures because I think there's such tenacity in them. I mean, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to be a mother. No, it's uh, not. One, and then it's not easy to have a job. And then it's not easy to, to do these things for everybody. I mean, uh, but yeah, it's, yeah, you really have to want it. You have to be hungry to do it. You have to um, see a bigger picture, and also too, sometimes you have to see like what are you um, teaching your kids too. Like as you grow up, like what are their stories of their mother, like the ancestry, like where do they come from, kind of thing. So, yeah. yeah. Are, are they thinking about? Are there? Are your kiddos thinking about college? I'm pretty sure you've told them this story, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. sure. And are they, are they college driven? They're already like, Oh, I want to go to this college, this college. Yeah. I think they're definitely college driven um, for sure. I think right now they're thinking a lot more about just getting involved and building their resumes and stuff, even in a way that I'm not sure I was as um, at their age. Yeah. 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 Um, Oh, for sure. I tell them stories when I'm like, Hey, you need to clean your room. And then I'm like, do you remember what I went through? Do you remember? (laughs) (laughs) Do I need to show you this body? (laughs) You can edit that out actually. (laughs) <laughs> i still use that <laughs> i don't plan on ever stopping and my mom still uses that on me by the way so. yeah good for her yeah that, that's some drive man I'm, I, I'm i'm a big baby about you know little pain and stuff i'm like nah i'm gonna go to school today but yeah, you had that drive and when you're hungry man you're gonna you're gonna get you're gonna get that food you're gonna get that bread man for sure i just mm-hmm. wish things were a little different though for for women not to be, I hope I don't come off sexist or anything, but really the, we're the caretakers. When the babies get sick, we're the ones that stay home. We're the ones that, you know, care for the most of the time, right? And I do remember in grad school, there was a, a pregnant, like I mentioned, woman, and she became ill in the middle of the semester. Mm-hmm. And I thought, and I hope there's some kind of program or that they, they don't expect her to start over the semester, or that they work with her, that you know and unfortunately i don't think that there's enough help for women in the universities and these programs there should be some kind of outreach for mothers and for pregnant expectant women when they're in school i think it's very needed i I imagine that there are women out there who can't attend classes who can't go to school because they're mothers because they're pregnant and we're just leaving them behind you know, given the opportunity, maybe they would attend college. Mm. And so, yeah, I hope there's somebody out there working on that. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I know at UTEP, at least, and I know at several other universities, they have groups of um, programs that support women who are mothers. And okay. I think it's, it's in the vein of of not just like pregnant mothers, but also um, sort of thinking about mothers on tenure track, right? Because... Um, and academia is so different in general. And this isn't just related to the arts world, but like the way it works is, you know, you get a tenure track position and then you have to show within this course of time, you know, your scholarship, your publications and everything you've done. And, you know, if a woman has a baby or two within that time frame, is there grace that's given to, to her the same as a colleague who maybe didn't have children or or is pregnant during the tenure process, you know what I mean? Cause it's a pretty strict timeline. And so I think at least there's women that are meeting and having these conversations. Um, but I know that they've attempted several groups but there's also been like maybe the woman leading it is like, you know, in a different space, but, but yeah. That's good to hear. I'm glad to hear that. So how long were you at the Rubin Center? I was at the Rubin Center for about seven years or so. Yeah, I can't believe it actually when I think about it because the time has flown for sure. Mm-hmm. And what did you see? Well, well, let me rephrase that. How did you choose your artists? Are there, what did the artists do to get into the show? What advice can you give to potential um, artists that want to show in galleries? Uh, what are the steps that artists should be taking? 
So I think with the Rubin Center, it's a little different because the focus is international artists. So although they do show some local artists, but I think it's like sort of particular situations, um, mostly the focus is international artists. So it's really hard for a local to show at the Rubin Center. I'd say really hard, but also we have had enough over time. But I think the mission and the statement and the spirit is definitely moving in that direction. The advice that I would give to artists who are thinking about showcasing in different places is to really like think strongly when about the body of their work, like not just like a strong piece here or there, but like really like, what are you trying to say? Like, what is the why? Like, what are you doing? Also what's been done before? Like too, you really have to also have some kind of understanding of our history of contemporary artists. You know, I mean, are you doing something that's original? Are you doing something that's pushing the envelope? Are you um, thinking critically in a way that like, you know, cause I think, I mean, there is art for art's sake, but I think there's also sort of more, um, I guess, contextual messages that happen within art too. So I don't think you necessarily have to, but I, I think thinking about the body of the work is something um, that I would think about. And also to how you share the work too. So, so for example, you're like, hey, I'm an artist. Um, I know a lot of gallery directors who get like, you know, hundreds of submissions every single year. And they get, um, when I worked in the Opossum Museum of Art, it was when I saw it like much more viscerally. I mean, we would just get like, boxes of applications from artists and they were like these beautifully designed things there was like memory sticks there was all kinds of things so I would be thoughtful of probably a website is the most convenient way of sharing your work or an Instagram page now also works um, but something that's very clean and concise and that has everything that a gallery director would need um, to move forward if they were going to do a show so like an artist statement what are you doing why are you doing it how long have you been doing it? Your CV, um, have you exhibited in other places? Um, also too, I think something is also forward thinking projects too. So I imagine like, I want an artist who's like so hungry and not just like sort of, you know, I mean, sort of forward thinking about um, maybe even ideas, not sort of solid ideas necessarily, but just kind of the curiosity that like yeah. hunger to learn and, and, but I think the why is is really important. I've been looking at so much work for the past few days um, because I mentioned I'm during the show for the University of Colorado Boulder. It's um, graduate work and undergraduate work. And so it's interesting to see like um, some of the work is like a lot of experimentation with different medias and, and things, which is great. And some of them is just like more of like a series sort of thinking about larger things. But I think if you're working to show in a gallery, you really have to be thinking bigger. And also thinking mixed media too is also something that I think is sort of thinking about creating a dynamic show too. Um, I feel like I was all over the place on that question. No, you're fine. Good, you're good. I wish I was like a little cleaner. No, no, no. <laughs> no, that's good. I have a, I have a question about the Colorado work and the El Paso work, did you see a big difference? And what difference did you see? Um, I think definitely something I saw that was a big difference was video work uh, okay. at Sea Boulder. They have a strong uh, video program. Well, they have a strong like photography and video program. And so uh, at this time, UTEP does not have that. Although they do have a photography, an area where you can submit photography, I think. Um, and CU Boulder also has a graduate program and UTEP does not, they have like, a, I think it's a multidisciplinary like program for graduate students, but it's not like an MFA. And so, um, and I think the other thing that I saw interestingly is I think in the work from CU, there was a lot more diversity. And what I mean oh. with diversity is there was more like people from different countries. So I was looking at artists, students who were like from Turkey and students who were from Greece, mm, yeah. students who were from, Mexico, uh, El Salvador. So like, just the very, like UTEP is very diverse, but I think it's mostly Hispanic. Right. right. Yeah, very regional no? Yeah, and yeah. in Colorado, it was definitely a different kind of diversity. So, which I think they've worked toward because when I was there, there was not very much diversity um, in the program. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> Victor is, uh, I was just thinking about this and I, I kind of wish I had 
looked into it sooner before our conversation, yeah. but is there a show at the Rubin Center from the past few years that has stood out to you? Because there's some that, that I've gone to and I go, wow. Um, can you think of any, Victor? Is there, are there any shows that stand out to you? Well, let me think. Dude, I'm, I'm, I'm like a very, I'm in, very introverted. And since when I was going to school and found out about the Rubin Center, I've had a kid. I was I had a kid, so I wasn't able to like venture out and do things. But the ones that I, the one that did stand out was the Mark Bradford one, just because mm -hmm. I was able to go hear him speak, and I'm glad I heard him speak, because I learned a lot, and it showed me how he viewed being an artist during during that speech. Uh, I forgot who it was, but. She, she, this person was saying something that, oh, Mark Bradford's this and that, whatever. And then he was like, this is what he's trying to say. And Mark Bradford said, no, that's not what I'm, that's not what it's about. I was, I was like, oh, snap, dude. I was like, <laughs> you see, I'm like, stop trying to talk for people. And like, it's different. The artist, you can't get inside that artist's brain no matter what. And mm -hmm. I like that. And that, that showed me exactly what I thought. Like, you know, we're different, the art historians and the artists. And, but we work together. You know, we, we, we both get, get each other there, you know. And I thought that was pretty cool. And I another, yeah. Sorry. So I learned a lot from that. I think I just seen seen that big piece that he had done just for just for that show was pretty neat. He talked to the students. I learned a lot from there. I learned about the MFA. Uh, one of I think we had talked about, you know, should you go to to a univer to should you not go to the same university for for a BFA and an MFA? And he had mentioned how he went to he got his MFA the same place he got his BFA. And I was like, well, you've mentioned you him if several he can times. It, then I'm going to do it too. If UTEP opens up an MFA, I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm going to stay here and I'm going to get it. And because it's close and I'm here and because that's what I could get. So like, if you could do it, I'm going to rock it too. You know? So I was inspired by that. I liked uh, the, I'm, I hope I'm saying that right. By you, Sova? Oh, Yana. Yeah. She's oh a good God. friend of mine actually from grad school. From wow. Boulder. Wow. Mm -hmm. How was that show? A ceramics uh, show. And it looks like she just paints on on wet clay. It looks like wet clay that she's painting on. And I'm so intrigued by her, uh, her work. I would love to sit down and go, okay, how do you do this? What is the, what magic is this? Because I've never, ever seen anything like that. I remember just looking at it and looking at it and I was in awe of her work and I still am um, amazing artist. I just love her work. And I started following her oh, good. <laughs> yeah. social media. That's like literally right there. And then I started searching for her. And yeah. then, um, and of course, El Paso artist, George Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. That it was beautiful. Too. Is gorgeous, gorgeous work. So the ceramic ones is what got you. Isn't that crazy? I mean, I do remember some 2D work. I, I just don't remember his name. It looked like they had done like skate. They were in the shape of skateboards. <clears throat> they were huge and they lined the walls and there was all printmaking. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember his name, unfortunately. But there have been some really good exhibitions. Um, how many of those do you think that you found by chance or was it through application or did you know of them and search them out yeah like did they did they that's, seek you out or you seek them out that's a good question i carrie is definitely like the lead in all aspects so a lot of the artists are from mexico i think is there's a really heavy um lean on talking about sort of border issues and things like that so carrie was definitely the um she's the director um the determining kind of voice in that. And I think a lot of people she knew and she sought out for sure. Um, I do think people do reach out. Um, it's hard to connect though, because it's so busy, like being in these spaces with such small staffs, like, you know, there's so much forward thinking. I mean, if you're doing it right with grant writing and exhibition work, I mean, you're at least two years thinking ahead, like the Rubin Center, it was, typically we would have exhibitions set for like two years so when people are interested in showing 
you know, we were, we would always recommend like there's other places in El Paso that might show, but as far as El Paso, as far as the Rubin Center, it's set and it has to be because if we have, if we're going to get the money to fund these projects and if we're going to get the money to fund these installations and a lot of these artists also did research trips here too. So um, I think something that was really exciting, which it's funny because we live in this area, but is working on the border for so many people. I mean, we are in a really uh, dynamic space yeah. for sure. And then UTEP literally is literally on the border. I could, from my office, see the border. I could see like cardboard houses on the other side from where I lived. Um, and it's changed over time. Um, but <clears throat> so um, I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> but um so I think like one the the work is two years out minimum like I mean usually because it takes a lot to to make these things happen um I think the other thing too as an artist which I didn't mention is to really like line out your budget too um is really important for galleries to see like this is my show this is what it's going to take um, these are my honorary fees as an artist. And um, it's interesting that you're both art educators too, because I think a big part of, like sometimes it's really hard to pay artists um, just for, I mean, it's not hard to pay them for an artist talk, but I think what's interesting is when artists are interested in working with community or they're interested in working in our particular situation, it was university, um, you know, classes or something. And we did a lot of interdisciplinary work too. So, um, so I think it's really, it's exciting to be also art educators and be in tune to like how to teach uh, the show, how to bring in, like I always felt like a big part of my job was activating the space. So Carrie would bring in the artists and then my job was, you know, making it exciting and, and making it alive and getting kids and of all ages, we, we had so many really diverse groups to try to like bring people in. And so I think first and foremost, if it was like um, an exhibition on, you know, technology and art, then we would focus on like what partners within not just the university, but within the community would be interested in engaging. If it was on immigration, we would bring in immigration attorneys and, um, just a variety of groups like the Annunciation House, just a variety of groups who would have interest. So we really were interested in the dialogue and the conversation, which is so much of what contemporary art is about really, um, to really activate the space, activate um, the artwork through the people who come to visit. Um, so I'm just having fun. Sorry. That's like this... okay. <laughs> like, I want to have fun too. <laughs> I could hear, I, I, I could see you like really trying like to ignore that. <laughs> Those aren't my kids, by the way. <laughs> You're like, oh, I don't... Okay. No. Um, that was really cool. I, that's so interesting, Melissa. I'm in awe of the the experiences, and I think how fortunate you are and you've been to meet so many artists and make those connections. I, I would that's as an artist and and uh, I'm also lo I love art history mm -hmm. I would just I think I'd just be sitting there the whole time going and asking them questions and questions and let me see and uh, I know that I always enjoyed going with our students you know we, we would set up these field trips and we would go and the kids too you know you could just see it in their eyes that well they had never seen something like that and their mm -hmm. bus rides to the school right all those questions from the kids and miss what was that and miss why did they do that and how did they do that and did you see this and, you know they're not going to forget that mm -hmm. i think it's i think it's wonderful and yeah. it's really fun too to meet so many artists like there are so many different personalities to um to artists like sometimes like you've been working so much with like images and like you know trying to um, grant right and trying to create programming around it and then you meet the artist and it's sometimes funny like how there's their personalities that are so different like you imagine them to be a certain way or something and they're not or yeah. <laughs> or they are like okay. even like they're so dynamic or you know because you try to create programming around them and so sometimes yeah you know, it's really fun to like yeah but absolutely to meet so many people that are just, I mean, really artists, they just think a little differently than other people. And that's really <laughs> wonderful to be around. Yeah, like who, you know, who wants yeah. the monotony like every day, yeah. you know, so it's really nice. And even sometimes like, you know, Carrie was really great about um, sort of just really 
welcoming like all any ideas like and I, it, there are so many times like if an artist like the, the greatest example is when an artist was like um you know let's put in a car right here and she was she's just <laughs> like, let's do it she's like let's do it so wow. then you know there's a lot of problem solving at the time Daniel who's now a teacher at Franklin um you know it was like okay like first we had to find a car like a burnt car in a lot so and then how do you get a car into the gallery so like they literally cut it in half and then yeah. brought it in and then soldered it back together so oh my like God. that's really exciting and I think Carrie was always really great at supporting really whatever the artists wanted to do in as much as you know, as much as we possibly can. And I think there's something to that, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, that's really the heart of, of the Rubin Center is, um, it's even in the mission, it's like, it's a laboratory for innovative practitioners, a laboratory. So when you think about a laboratory, right, you're experimenting, experimenting. and sometimes it's amazing. And sometimes there's explosions, but there is learning and growth and experiences throughout it. So it's, yeah. it's what a, a great way of, of, uh, <laughs> of describing that. The gallery, a laboratory. Imagine, yeah. imagine getting a car inside that place. You should, you should have connected with one of the frats there at the university. Be like, hey, we got something. We need a car. <laughs> get disassemble this car and we assemble it inside. The building, man. <laughs> it's kind of funny because I'm like kind of. Um, I I definitely feel like I'm a much more spiritual person, and I used to feel like there was like this weird juju with the car. Like that sounds like a weird thing, yeah. but like. It was like this burnt car, which had this story, right? And I, I really feel like the energy of things, like I, I believe in that. It sounds crazy. But, oh, wow. um, but, you know, that car was burnt. And so, you know, you assume there's an accident of some sort possibly, you know what I mean? You just don't yeah. know, but I'm like, should we like kind of leave the car away? <laughs> <laughs> and then the artist wanted to place in these old televisions, but like not the oh, television, okay. with the, the screen, the televisions that kind of had that backing in them, like the old school. And so as I yeah. grew up, I'm assuming you guys grew up with it too. Like, yeah, the um, tube. Which are not that easy to find. Like we went to every swamp meet in El Paso along Alameda, Sigum, I mean, everything. <laughs> and they just don't make them anymore. Like they don't even, even there's a special place for yeah. the dump of them, which is really interesting too about like artists and reuse, reduce, like re reduce. Recycle. Re Cycle, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. What are you gonna that do with like, um, televisions? <laughs> that brings me to this question. It was um, okay. I'm gonna mess this up because I forgot my notes. Is there a a particular show that you just knew as you were putting it up that there was gonna be some controversy? Hmm. Like you start seeing the work, start putting it up. You're like, oh, something's gonna, someone's gonna trip on this were there any uh, were there any complaints did people ever have a negative reaction to any of the shows that you that you put together as a museum educator and as an art educator i'm always like you know nudity is something like yana's uh mm -hmm. work there was a lot of nudity there was a lot of um sexuality in some of the paintings that she did too um so that's something i think about was for as kids but i think at a university you have a little bit more um more leeway I think you know it's an educational institution and I'm like a firm believer I mean even when I was at Asleta I remember we'd have a few pieces I just I feel like that's part of academia is teaching nudity in a way that's like you know safe and and not yeah. like making it a thing and I think you know obviously especially with what our kids are exposed to nowadays I mean there's just so much sexuality that's like not thoughtfully like um yeah dealt with that it's an opportunity like to use the arts to talk about it so yeah that's crazy do you think that with the the rise of social media apps like tiktok and instagram and where artists are more and more showing you know their work on social media is that affecting galleries do you think it's affecting galleries positively negatively uh, is or is social media our new gallery that's a good question too. I mean, it's certainly a way to share your work that's like instant, effective, you know, I mean, and, it, and when it gets reshared too, that's a whole other like kind of world, right? It's just, um, but I think, I mean, it certainly has its place. It's certainly kind of out there. I think the thing that I'm thoughtful about, even as I'm during the show, even throughout is like, 
really thinking about like what's original too like you know like really thinking about your work and um like what are you trying to say what are you trying to do and um because I think with social media too like you know you know, even with base, like you guys, you know, the visual arts scholastic event here in Texas, mm -hmm. like there's all these rules about copyright and, you know, making sure the work is original and making sure if there's a photograph or if there's a portrait that that student owned it from the beginning to the end. And I think that there's something to that too, which I really appreciate, um, like even that kind of ownership and authenticity is something that I think is hard to control because, you know, I mean, you can go on Pinterest and- right there's like, <laughs> I like that yeah I like that vase does that because artists should these kiddos should keep that in mind when they're creating artwork in the future you know mm -hmm. take your own pictures have your own references and know mm -hmm. what your what your work is about yeah yeah and the work is actually so so much more interesting I mean in the beginning when I started at Asleta like some of the art shows I mean we'd get like the Madonnas and the and the Marilyn Monroe's and the, you know, we'd always get like a certain number of these like, um, yeah. like portraits. Mm -hmm. um, and then Vase really pushed kids to like, we got to see kids and their friends. We got to see selfies. You know, I got to see like really pretty pieces as a juror. Um, I remember there was this one young girl dealing with like um, anorexia, but I mean, when students have to own their pictures and own their stories, from beginning to end, it just really changes the work like all together. And they're thinking critically. They're thinking about like, what do I want to say? Not just like, I need to do this assignment and I perfectly executed this, you know, Marilyn Monroe grid style. You know what I mean? It's not about right. perfection. Yeah. It's, about, it's about creating and it's about thinking through ideas and pushing harder and, you know, and observation too is also super important. Um, Do you think, though, that there's going to be a decline in art galleries because of social media? Or, or is it benefiting? Um, I think art galleries are always struggling um, in general. Um, it's interesting to see what the pandemic does for mm -hmm. galleries, too, because, you know, galleries just run on... Um, you know, obviously the art that they sell, but they take a heavy percentage of that art. And then I think for some time it was kind of moving from the galleries into like art fairs, right? Because all of a sudden you had like this heavy concentration of, you know, art collectors. And so these galleries could go like, you know, and that was the way people were selling. It was just this instant way to capture interested audiences with money. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's curious to see what happens after um, COVID for sure, um, when the world opens up again. Um, and if there's like kind of a push towards something different, I think like university art galleries, like, I mean, a lot of museums and galleries are struggling for sure. A lot of cultural institutions will continue to struggle um, mm -hmm. after this with the numbers, with the limited amounts. I mean, um, before I left the Rubin Center, I was a part of this group that was um, supported by the El Paso Community Foundation. Um, it was Katie Heron and Stephanie Otero, and their whole goal was getting all the cultural institutions together to start to brainstorm, like, how can we be relevant? Like, you know, and it became like a whole campaign of like, what does El Paso look like without a symphony, El Paso Symphony Orchestra? Like, what does El Paso look like without museums? Like, what if we had to travel? I mean, we're already ge geographically isolated compared to other, other mm -hmm. places. Um, so it just like begged the question, like, so what if we don't get funding after this whole thing? Like, what does our world look like? What does it look like for our kids? And for so many El Pasoans who don't travel, I think that's something that um, the Rubin Center often like sort of considers is that, you know, when you have um, a population that doesn't travel out, you really have to work hard to bring new ideas, you know, fresh experiences, yeah. things inward so that our kids can experience something different, you know? I mean, it's very true. Very true. Grants. <laughs> you, you're involved in grants, right? No. Mm -hmm. Remember, oh, big, um, <clears throat> big time. <laughs> since I, ever since I met Melissa, uh, I would ask her advice. You know, like when I became a teacher, or like, hey, how much should I? How much should I ask for? You know, supplies and stuff. And I was like, all right, cool. I'm going to do that. And then. The school I was what working at, they're, they're like, no, I can't get you all this. They're like, oh, man. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's, um, 
if you don't know, uh, Melissa is the one that um, encouraged me to, well, she helped me get my, do my first mural over there at a, at Eastwood Knowles, which is now painted over, of course. I know. <laughs> oh, no. It actually hurt my heart when I went to go visit. Like, <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. There needs and to be like general etiquette. A law. Yeah. <laughs> no, there was another art teacher too that he's like, oh, I did one too at Eastwood Knowles and they, they, they painted over that too. I was like, all right. And I would tell the kiddos because the kids that were coming to me, some of them went to Eastwood and I was like, hey, do you guys remember these this mural? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, I did it. And they're like, oh, that's cool. It's not there anymore. I was like, oh, dang, I didn't know. Did you document I, it? Or did you have it well documented? Yes. I, it's all on my phone, so I need to really take that out and save it. So I have that. And <laughs> where was I going with this? Um, there were grants and money and stuff and asking for stuff. Uh, you also encouraged me to do the Artist Incubator Program. Mm -hmm. And when I did the artist incubator program, I'm, I'm going to be straight up and honest. I felt my Victor. What art, is the artist art incubator program? Oh, <laughs> Melissa, what is the artist incubator program? <laughs> <laughs> so the city, um, the El Paso um, um, MCAD, like Museum of Cultural Affairs Department in El Paso, the city offers just a variety of cultural funding for. Um, local organizations, local artists, um, and they've been just a wonderful support for artists. I'm not sure if this is gonna follow with a different story, but for the most part, they've been really supportive. Um, you know, uh, they've been really aggressive about asking for larger grants and then funding um, smaller organizations too. And right now, Ben Fife, who has been a long um, supporter of arts education, as long as I've experienced it, he's now leading the department. Um, oh, I so know. Artist incubator grant. Um, I don't. I don't know what they're offering now, but it's you know, it's sort of a smaller grant um, usually, and it supports. I'm not sure exactly. They have so many different programs. I've sat on the committee, the selection committees before, but Victor, I don't know if you want to talk about the your experience with the. Yeah, let me talk. Yeah, <laughs> uh -oh. I'm, I'm going to be honest, uh, and, uh -oh. and this goes to my question. Hold uh, my question. All right, this is going to lead to my question, right? So. I felt very uh, inexperienced when writing this stuff out. You know, I was hyped. You're like, oh, I'm, I'm like, I was just straight out of college. I was like, cool, I'm going to do this grant. I'm going to do this and it's going to, it's going to pop off. And then I was writing monies and then I was writing my thing. And I got the grant. I did the show. Uh, I don't think anyone from the city went. Cause that was another, there was another show happening at that time. And I was thinking, man, no one came over from the, from the city. People came over to see my stuff, but mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not saying like, I'm like the only one sitting there, right? In the room. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no one from the city came over, check it out, whatever. I was like, oh man, I don't know. That, that's kind of weird. And in the end, I felt like I disappointed myself. I did not do what I, all the things that I had in mind, for this art show, for this, for this grant, right. Uh, for the artist incubator program. And that, that made me retreat into this spot <clears throat> in my mind of what am I going to, what am I going to create? Did I, did I mess this up? Did I, did I do this body of work and my whole, you know, heart wasn't in it. Was it, you know, was I it not a good experience for you then? Did it? It was uh, a good experience, but I felt like I let myself down and I uh -huh. didn't do what I what I had to do. I think because I was a first year teacher at that time too. Uh -huh. So being a first year teacher, doing the artist incubator program, that was not a good combination for me. Wow. I was not being able, I, I didn't, I wasn't able to do it fully to what I wanted to do. Uh -huh. And that, I don't know that that traumatized me, man. Like I've as seen... an artist mentally, I was like, no, dude, like what is this? So now I'm sitting here trying to think about my body of work and I've I've struggled these last seven years trying to come oh, up with wow. a body of work. I've seen and MCAT finally I'm starting to get into it. Do more outreach to artists uh in like having workshops and teaching them how to write the grant, trying to yeah. explain more in detail you know, how to get a grant. And I've been to some of those workshops. They're very informative. 
I, it was actually one year was um I don't I don't know I was gonna call myself a judge where I actually was able to read the applicants and and award this point system I was actually doing that on my last semester of grad school so mm -hmm. I would go to the studio and do my work and then I'd go back to my place and and sit there and look at the it, it was it was really interesting to see all the applicants and it's interesting Melissa because you touched about on how the artists that felt more personal that they came from a more personal place I think are the ones that I was more um attack attracted to right to to award the point systems to because I was interested in knowing more about what they were trying to do um mm -hmm. and that that taught me a lot also being able to to see how that worked I have applied for that grant program one time and then never again <laughs> and I should. I should I mean definitely want to encourage artists out there to apply for these kinds of grants they're there for you to help yeah. you uh, we should definitely take advantage of them. And that leads me to that question that I was gonna I was gonna ask was, is there what shouldn't an artist put into a grant? What is something that that you've seen you're like oh no nah, no nah, dude. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I have two points. Like one, I want to talk about like your experience with uh, the artist incubator just really quickly. I want to say like oh, you oh. have to be gentle with yourself because yeah. you know being a first year teacher is no joke like no joke and any teacher will say the same thing you know it's tough you're not just teaching students you're teaching students with special needs you're teaching modifications you've got like all these uh you know students you're going between two schools so like that in and of itself is huge mm -hmm. and creating a body of work at a level that you want to be proud of is i mean you did it and you followed through and you finished the grant and you did what you had to and you've got to like you know own it yeah. You know, be proud of it that you did the completion and and let it go. And you got to move on. You got to like, you got to apply again and you got to think right. bigger in, in a time that works for you. So right now, like get those creative juices working and start thinking about it. And you got to like, you can't get stuck. Like as an artist, I think there's so many things from during too. That's something I'm super thoughtful about. I have been through so many juries, like during programs where I have like, been sort of with with the jurors walking through from the Sleta to the Rubin Center. Like, I mean, I can go into a show and I'm like, oh my God, that piece is like, like blew my mind. And a juror will come in and not even like give that piece a second thought. You know what I mean? I'm like, like, oh my gosh. So, yeah. I mean, you, the, as an artist, you have to like have the tenacity and uh, like, you just gotta like, let go and keep going you got to keep creating you got to keep pushing your ideas mm -hmm. you got to like you can't like get stuck on something that didn't work out like you know what I mean? that's part of the process is growing yeah. did it Very you important. learned something from it you followed through and like you got to like pick up and you know think about your next body of work think i mean if that's if that's exciting to you if, if you have something to say if you want to do that like you yeah. you can't like ruminate like where that was because from jurors, like, you know, I, I applied for this thing. I didn't get in. I didn't win. Like, you got to, like, go back because, you know, I mean, sometimes yeah. it's single jurors. Sometimes it's three jurors. I mean, you can't, as an artist, you have to keep, like, put, I mean, if that's what you want to do, if you're excited yeah. about it, like, you got to, like, keep rolling. You got to, like, keep pushing. And you can't let it get you down, you know? I it's, know. like, part of the story, part of your journey. You just got to, like... So, I mean, I, that's the thing. It's really hard for artists to see that end. And yeah. I get to like that end, you know, like just, it's like, you know, it's just one opinion or it's just this, or it's just that, like, you've got to like, you got to yeah. keep going. Yeah. It's a, it's a learning experience. And throughout those, those seven years, I'm already going to my eighth year teaching already. And I felt like oh. I was like in a, in a master's program, you know, this whole time. You know, and it, it's crazy because I ended up becoming a better artist because I became a teacher. And oh, yeah. That's that's something that I always felt like, oh, well, those I had started drawing this big old um, I started doing this drawing for the, for that for that program for the artist incubator grant. Right. For that show. And I still have it. I started it and I was like, my mind like is not ready for this. This one drawing that I have, like my skills weren't up to par to do that one. So I started maybe maybe like two years ago I started working on it again and I was able to draw exactly what I wanted on that paper and it's crazy because 
you just develop and that artistic maturity I've, I've talked about it before it's like it, i'm starting to feel it you're starting to feel it throughout the years and i still haven't given up you know i've been researching i've been trying i've been drawing daily with the students and getting better and better mm -hmm. and figuring these things out so i'm getting ready to hopefully apply again to work maybe up. no not maybe not maybe no nah, yeah. <laughs> right. next right. time next time for sure <laughs> and I'm, I'm doing it i'm doing it and, so, it's gonna, and it, we're gonna do it melissa now that we're talking about art and, and our personal work mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about the work you've created or you create mm -hmm. what's your style like what kind of artist do you do you even categorize yourself as a certain artist you know a lot of us are like oh i'm a printmaker or i'm a painter i'm a what would you say where do you fall in it's funny because i think like an artist is somebody who's constantly working and creating and i and i think definitely before i had kids i made a lot of art i loved ceramics i loved drawing i loved everything i loved literature i loved just so much and i think when i had kids i don't know i didn't have time or something <laughs> i wonder <laughs> why <laughs> <laughs> um so a lot of like I think my practice became work with them like so for example like um like I would have my kids draw each other like uh -huh. you know with that kind of stick drawing where the legs are coming out of the head and then I would yeah. embrace it oh wow <laughs> so I mean we did like kind of collaborative work um we did a lot of paper mache but it was like definitely a very different I didn't make things that I was like feeling at the time but I just loved like the tactileness of growing and experiencing things with them um, um I'm trying to think but yeah I think that everything I'll, like anything creative I've ever done with them has been like collaborative projects and I think now they're older and they're like 15 <laughs> so actually like once a week um I'll do this since it's COVID I'll do this abbreviated art history lesson with them where um they're both in AP world history. And so I'm just trying to teach them about one art artist and nice. just, I'll take my computer and I promise them it's no longer than like 10 minutes. It's going to go over like 30 seconds. <laughs> I've lost them. You guys probably know that as teachers too. Like, no, yeah. I gotta like be quick and I gotta like uh, deliver. Um, but uh, so currently uh, what I'm working on is um, portraits of the kids and I'm uh, doing some embroidery with them too. So um, not with them um, on my own, but that's something. And I've started a sketchbook again, which I, oh, I, had a, sketchbook. I, was, yeah. <laughs> I think I've had sketchbooks since I was like in the fifth grade. And it's so weird because I actually have them still like all of them. And it's so funny. And I have wanted, I've been through so many moves and life changes and I always want to get rid of them, but I can't. It's like so weird. Like, <laughs> and they're like, you know, I mean, them with me. Pieces, and pieces, like, you know, concert stubs. Like, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, sketches coming out of like pieces. I mean, it's just, they're like messy and full of stuff, but they're like so personal. So I totally have them in like these weird like bins. So I think I'm sketching again, which is something I haven't done in a. In Victor a has a really important question. I was waiting for that. Like, you know, we're itching <laughs> about to ask your sketchbook. About it. Are you ready? <laughs> okay, we, we have this thing where we're gonna we're asking artists, uh, our guests, are you a first pager? Do you draw on the first page of your sketchbook? I don't. You know what I have done? <laughs> like so many things. I, I, but I, I don't. I don't sketch in that. But I always write like a quote or like oh nice um, like just a really clean quote of something that I feel like nice kind of I like that I like for like that yeah we need to start keeping like a scorecard Victor of who says yes and who says no and then, then we'll come back and like hey <laughs> new sketchbook so that, that I guess what we're trying to do is maybe get people he's, to, he's trying to do because me I'm sorry. not a first page let me either. speak for myself <laughs> I'm, I'm trying I'm to get everybody to just either. break that ice, man, on your sketchbook. And like, you know what? I'm just going to do something on the then first one. If, if you don't like what you do on that first page, Victor, you almost don't even want to go into that sketchbook anymore. You've ruined yeah, you it, right? Like? Like? <laughs> wow. Yeah, know. I'm not a first pager either. Wow. Every single first page of my sketchbooks are clean and pure. <laughs> That's 
So, yeah, I'm trying to change that for myself for sure. <laughs> Melissa, is there okay, anything? <laughs> is there anything that you'd like to add? Anything that we haven't touched on that you would like to add to our conversation? I'm glad you guys are opening up the conversation um, and taking the time to do that because I know as art teachers, you guys are very busy. Uh, very crazy. <laughs> We're crazy. <laughs> Yeah. Well, if it's uh, something that you want to do, you know, you're going to do it. Right. And this is something that, you know, I want to do. So it's not even work. Right. Is, are there I'm any sorry, artists? Interview that. Are there any artists out there that you think we should have a conversation with? In El Paso? Anywhere. Oh, oh anywhere. Um, gosh, there's so many. I don't know. I'm going to have to email that to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I follow so many artists. I, I don't know. I yeah. Can think, you know. Yeah. Is there is there an artist right now that you're following? I mean, like on Instagram or whatever. You're like, you're always checking up on on their work. Someone you'd like to introduce us to? Mm -hmm. Not like I to talk to them and stuff, but like, hey, yo, you got to check out this artist. Check out their work. Yeah, I think an artist you guys probably already know, but I always really love what he's doing because it's something like fresh and interesting. And uh, is he Kenya? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. But I really love what he's doing. I think he really is an intuitive artist. I think he, um, like, he really has something to say. And it's like, I'm I'm always interested to hear what that is. Like, you know, he's sort of been doing really interesting work about um, immigration, and um, but it's also fun too. It's like, uh, you know, he's got this kind of comic book style. Um, he does the zines too. Um, I've always like loved working with him, and also getting him to connect with. Um, High school, high school students. Yeah. So anything with the Rubin Center, we'd have. Um, and he's super busy. He's doing a lot of interesting things. He's illustrating books and such. But um, yeah, I, I really love what he's doing. I also love um, Vincent Valdez too. Yes. Um, so I really that's, love his work. It's on my list. That's on my list to, to get hopefully. Yeah. So if you I got the hookup, man, let me know. Let me know. <laughs> I don't know. We'll ever go through that go list. Talk to him. We have a list of people that. That's, that we want can you help us get them or not? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think I'm sure. I mean, anywhere that I can help. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta, I we gotta, so many people have Instagram pages too, so it's easy to like drop a yeah. message. Oh yeah, yeah. He's super interesting yeah, too. Um, There's so many artists. Yeah, I'm, I'm, the I'm thing that I like. Works. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, go ahead. I love Alice Neal. She's one of my favorite painters. Oh my god. Thoughtful about right now, like female artists for sure. Um, but yeah, I love her style. I love a painting. Like, yeah, I, I think she's just phenomenal. She has a retrospective right now at the Matt Museum. Um, Did we so, not go see her work in Houston? Were you, weren't you there with us when they showed her yeah, work in Houston? Yeah, yeah. Wasn't uh -huh. that phenomenal? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I remember that exhibition. Yeah, I miss those trips. That was so fun. They're not the same. <laughs> <laughs> it was it, for those that I just jumped into that uh, our district would send us out of town uh, when we would do the visual arts scholastic events and one of the places was Houston and their museum had an exhibition of Alice Neal and we got to take our students and the teachers it was just fantastic mm -hmm. it was a great show just to remember that yeah I love her work and seeing yeah. them in person is so different right than seeing them in books and, and that's why it's so important that school districts and organizations really, um, I wanted to say donate, but really back or support our programs and art students. And these trips are so important. Uh, so I was really saddened when our school district no longer allowed for that day to take our students to the museums because I don't think they realized just what an education it was for them to go and visit these museums which yeah. they had probably will, had never done, you know, mm -hmm. and and the impact that it had on our students. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's a shame that the budgets are always, you know, we always get affected. The kids are the ones that get affected from these. It's budgets. always like a little get in, get out. Yeah. Yeah, it's right. a shame. It's such a shame. That's what I liked about the other district that I'm not going to mention names and stuff, but they're real <laughs> cool. Uh, yeah. We had a day where we show up, we do these visits and yeah, everything. We're like, going all over the place and then the next day is uh, the they event can't do that anymore and then 
and then go home afterwards. Nice. It has been such a pleasure to connect with you again. It's been so long. I, I just yes. wish I had, I wish we wouldn't like, I see people that we're, we're talking to or, and I contact them. I go, man, how long has it been? Why are we waiting so long? <laughs> For sure. I can't believe it's been a year since like COVID and everything. Right. So it's pretty new, yeah. You look fantastic and so happy and uh, it was has been such a pleasure to talk to you. You always make me smile and I could listen to you for days and days and days. You, <laughs> so much knowledge. <laughs> for real, yeah. for real. It's always been cool to talk to you. Yeah. Thank you Thank so much you for taking this time. Blessings to you guys. This is exciting that you guys are doing this. So I think it's really going to be interesting for a lot of people to connect with. So we hope so. Thank you for your work. Yeah. And if you guys need help with anything or getting memes or whatever. Thank Love you. Me. Yes, yeah. for Take sure. Care, Thank Enjoy you. your family. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Spring break. Bye. Oh, bye. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <clears throat> Excuse me. Edit that little cough out. <laughs> All right. That she is so um, knowledgeable. I mean, really, I could just listen to her talk and talk her experiences. But you know what really stood out to me was when she said that, because you know how we mentioned in the beginning how she has studied so many different things and her resume looks like it's all, it's not a straight road, it's a jagged road. But and how she said, you know, I just did what I liked. And I think, wow, what a great, great way to see things, right? Yes, that's key. I like this and I'm going to do that. I'm going to study that because I like it. Um, what do what you day. like or what? Yeah. So, you know what? I like this. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to look into it and I'm going to take I'm care of it. I'm going to go for it. I think, yeah, I think a lot of us, we, we do get stuck and we need to do stuff that we love for sure. And invest in it. Invest in it. Because you're investing in yourself. No, exactly. And it, it's tough. I think a lot of us, I think Corona, this whole pandemic thing, hopefully it helped people realize that. It's like, yo, life is too short. Mm -hmm. You know, we make those career changes. Hey, I want to go learn French. I'm going to pick up some French, you know, whatever. I'm going to start a podcast. <laughs> I'm going to start a podcast, man. Let's do it. Yeah. And, you know, people are realizing right now, you know, hopefully sooner than later, you know, when when it's too late i've always um thought about what a cool job being a curator would be mostly because of the people you meet right like the artists you meet and the work you get to see and to to work with them and help them set up their work that that's a really cool experience to be surrounded by art is something that i want to be doing no matter what always creating always talking to yeah. artists just like even right here you know we're talking to the artists yeah we're still surrounding ourselves with art and it's cool yeah, anything like, she said that stood out to you that she's a she's not a first pager <laughs> nah as soon as she talked about a sketchbook i saw your face just psh, boom it is victor's gonna ask i'm like all right i just saw your face not a first pager, but she said she wrote, she writes a quote. That's a cool idea. Yeah. I'm very sure. Like I had um, students do a motivational page where, where they're looking through the sketchbook. They always have that one motivational quote that they picked out and that they could always come back to it or that's, maybe they'll run into it when that's they need it. Excellent. That's excellent. Victor. I like that. Yeah. Maybe sure. that first page should be that. Maybe it should be your motivational page. Yeah. Maybe, huh? I like that. A quote or, or a motivational quote and then fill it up with things that are going to motivate you that you can look at. What? And maybe I won't be at first. I'll be a first pager. Yeah, I just write things. Things yeah. that come up are like, oh, that's cool. I'm going to write it in my first page. I like or like that. On, the, on, the, on the inside of the cover and do that. I'm like, oh, there's a song I like. Oh, I'm going to put it on that one. I like that. And it'll just be little things that you could always go back to. And, and it's fun to see it years later. You're like, and then you're like, why did I write that? Or like, or well, what is this timestamp? Yeah, because yeah. I've done that where I have some time, some timestamps from a movie, but I won't write down the movie. Oh wow. like, But it's like at eight, the 18 minute mark, 18 minute and 34 second mark of this movie. Someone said something at this 
you know. Oh, that's like, cool. But I don't know, just very random. Yeah, I'm so glad you? you talked to us. You know, I um, when I was younger, I used to keep a diary. And then something happened in my life that was really, um, I was going to say tragic, but I couldn't write about it. Like I couldn't, I used to write every day religiously and then something happened and that I couldn't write about it. And then I never wrote again. Like it just stopped. And then I've never done it. I've never kept the diary again since that day. And I still have that diary. So I can still see the day that that thing happened to me. And I no longer wrote. And it's just going to stay like that? Are you ever going to go back that way? Back to it? No. No, No? This was was, (laughs) years and years and years and years ago. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, in my sketchbooks, I I know that we're going to do a little podcast about our sketchbooks I have so many different ones and I think that was really cool when Melissa said that she has her sketchbooks from when she was in the fifth grade that goes to show you like how personal sketchbooks are yeah. you know that you especially, can go back and look at them especially having it back then yeah I didn't carry sketchbooks until later later I didn't yeah. know about sketchbooks in high school yeah. dang no <laughs> Wow. I actually kept one when I was in elementary school, but it wasn't a sketchbook. My mom would go and buy it. I should be saving this for our podcast, the other podcast. She used to go back then, people used to write notes, letters to loved ones because there was mm-hmm. no email. And so she always had these notepads because she would write to my grandparents who lived in Mexico. And so she would buy me those. And that's what I would draw in. So that mm-hmm. there, there were writing pads. Those were writing pads. And they were little, they were little like like nine like i don't know eight by fives or even smaller six i don't even remember they were small they i'm sure i have them somewhere on my little drawings when i was a kid yeah. but you know what else i like that she said when we asked her about her work and she said that she likes to take that she would take things that her kids would draw and then she would embroider them and she calls yeah. them collaborations yeah not like that because uh, our kids are actually the same age and that that's weird. Uh, not, well, she was talking about how her kids, you know, the ones with the, I guess, the drawings that they had, the one with the heads with the arms sticking out of the head, you know, and that's exactly what my kid was drawing too. And I incorporated his drawings in one of my silk screens. And my my son, what he would do is he would do the of course the circle or the oval and put the face in it, and then the the hands and the legs, and then he would draw like a little like a little butt on the side. <laughs> It's hilarious. So he'd always draw the little butts on everything, and I put that on, on a silk screen, with him wearing like the old school Daniel Boone hat, the like raccoon mm-hmm. hat with the tail, mm-hmm. and like holding a shotgun. Well, it was a fake shotgun, right? But it was fun. That's a great way for you guys to like commemorate that that age of your kids. You know, I'm sure yeah. she looks on, at those drawings and those embroideries and can reminisce on that time of life with her of her kids and stuff i would love to see what she's doing now i was going to ask her i don't know if i did or not if what she's embroidering right now are, is still work from with her kids i think she mentioned that she, it is i would love to see her work yeah, i know sure. I'm, I'm sure it's very personal for her later on for sure like let, yeah. her, let her build it up and complete and we could always give back and hopefully share and share with that for sure um well, what else like how do you how do you how do you know her like did you get to work really close with her obviously because you were in the district but, mm-hmm. uh, well I met her through the school district because she became um, the gallery curator and uh, I know that there's a more specific title to her to her position but of course was also a gallery curator and she used to work very closely with the teachers, very closely. Um, and we just hit it off. And I was always attracted to her energy, intelligent, very yes. energetic, very positive. And man, I, I just want to always surround myself by people like that because they really bring that right energy, right? That you that you need. It's like a good cup of coffee, people like yeah. that. <laughs> and uh, we used to like share, well, we would sit together like on our trips 
or I would carpool with her and we had some really nice conversations. I'm glad she brought up that story about uh, her being pregnant with her twins while she was trying to get through grad school because she did tell me a personal story once about that time and how difficult it was uh-huh. to be expecting twins and trying to do grad school. Um, you know, God, that's hard. And so her tenacity to get it done. I, I also, um, when I first started college, I was also expecting my, my oldest child who just turned, oh, she's going to hate me if I tell you how old she is, so I won't say it. She, <laughs> I remember being pregnant and, and going to school and becoming ill and, and missing three classes in a row from, and returning to school to find out that I had been withdrawn oh, snap. from some of the courses. And it was so hard because to get the money, to raise the money. Yeah. And then I knew I was going to have the baby and it was going to, and, and I couldn't return. I didn't return for a while because then I became a mother and I had to work and care for my child. So I'm sure that still happens. You know, yeah. women, they have to pick. I'm not saying men don't, but being pregnant and going to school, whew, it's hard. It's really hard. Yeah, that's different. It's like I said, like I was saying before, it was like, man, I'll, you know, sometimes, you know, well, this is men will like, we get sick on like, Oh, and then, you know, we want our mothers and then our, our wives are all taking care of us and stuff. And we're all big babies about it. And then, then, but you, but you all, you know, y'all are tough, tough, you know, we all have thinking to about my mother trying to finish high school while yeah trying to finish yeah. high school at 15 you know I've just being just been born and she yeah, would tell I... me that you know she's like oh the bus would drop me off and then i would walk with you with with you on the stroller and stuff and it's like wow but but maybe that kind of i don't know we'll go we'll get into that later i'm all well, I'm, I'm really glad that we spoke to Melissa. I'm so glad that I know her and uh, so much to learn from her. I hope we get to talk to her again. We will. We future. will. She's one of those people you want to talk to and yeah. always keep in contact with. And like you said earlier, like that energy that she just has, uh, she's one of those few people that when you see her, you're going to, you smile no matter smile. what. You're like, yeah, dude. right away. <laughs> and then she'll talk to you and, you know, you conversate. And I would go visit her over there at the, at the, at, the, at her office when she was with the district and then she'd give me pointers about the grants and this and that stuff and about the mural i was going to do and about another mural that that yeah. someone that another principal was talking to me about but i wasn't able to get that second mural because i ended up getting a job as a teacher so then i had to had to dump that one but very always giving. always very giving with information and we should definitely have her again yeah for sure well, I think we've reached the end of our conversation. Yes, we so, have. This is Friends in Our Places. Don't forget to like us and follow us and share us and and come back for our next conversation. I am Lorena Williams. And I am Victor Mujerin. And we'll see you soon. See you soon. Later, later. Bye. Bye-bye.